everyone. The webinar will begin at 1230 Eastern. We ask that you campaign, connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media, on Facebook, like the page at Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. Please use the hashtag GLR Reading and or hashtag Funder to Funder and tag us to tweet anything you uh, heard from today's conversation and we'll be sure to retweet it. We encourage you to share your thoughts and reflections on social media, so once again, please connect with the campaign on Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, Follow the account at Reading by Third. The webinar will begin shortly and it will be recorded. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this second in a series of funder to funder conversations with this one focused on including family and community math as an essential part of early learning strategies. My name is Sarah Torian and I'm a consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and in managing its online webinar series. Before we get started today, I just wanted to go over a couple of really quick housekeeping details with you. First of all, I'd encourage you to introduce yourself. Let us know your name and organization using the chat box on your Zoom screen. Second, just wanted to share that all webinar attendees will be participating in listen-only mode during today's conversation, and that's to avoid any background noises or distractions during the presentations. But we do strongly encourage your active engagement throughout the conversation, and so I'd encourage you to share any thoughts reflections or opportunities that you see for increased alignment and collaboration in the chat box on your Zoom screen. I would also encourage you to post any questions that you would like to ask of our panelists using the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. And please look for that Q&A box to post your questions. It makes it much easier for us to track those questions and share them with the panelists when we move into Q&A. Third, just a quick reminder that today's conversation is being recorded and a link to that recording will be sent to everybody who registered for today's webinar. Uh, keep an eye out for an email that will go out uh, later on this week, probably on Friday, with a summary of today's conversation and a link to all resources, including the webinar recording. And then finally, just a quick heads up that we will be posting a very brief survey poll after the presentations are complete during the Q&A portion of the webinar. And I'd encourage you to take just a couple of quick moments that, it really does help us with our commitment to continuous improvement and making sure that these conversations are relevant to your work and meeting your needs. Now I'd like to share just a little bit of background about this new GL, or this new Funder to Funder conversation series. As you can see on the screen, we've got the campaign is hosting three of these conversations during the month of July, and we plan to return to them with a few additional sessions later on in the fall. So keep an eye out and stay tuned for more information about that later on. But why is the campaign hosting these funder-focused conversations? Uh, the funder-to-funder conversations are in response to what we heard during our 2018 listening tour as campaign leaders traveled around the country and heard state and local funders asking for more opportunities for shared learning, collaboration, and co-investment among local funders as well as in partnership with their more national counterparts. So through these conversations, we're seeking to lift up and align the assets that these different types of funders bring to this work. The local knowledge, earned credibility, and trusting relationships that state and local funders have, and the increased access to experts and emerging research and the larger funding capacity that national funders have in an effort to yield better outcomes and a higher return on investment for all of this work. So that's what this new series will seek to do. And we're confident that with more intentional efforts to align our collective philanthropic resources, it will help us to move the needle on third grade reading proficiency for children in low income families. So we're incredibly excited that you were able to join us for this conversation. And I hope that you'll tune back in next week for our third Funder to Funder conversation as we explore the potential for deeper collaboration focused on the early learning educator workforce. We'll hear from Jacqueline Jones of the Foundation for Child Development and Jesse Rasmussen from the Buffett Early Childhood Fund as they present the work and the efforts of the Early Educator, Early Educator Investment Collaborative. 
a collaborative of funders of which both of their foundations are a part. And then they'll engage in conversation with local funders and national partners about opportunities for increased alignment. Now I'd like to share just a little bit of background about the GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar series. As you can see on the screen, we've got a number of great sessions planned for the coming weeks, with a session every Tuesday in the 3 p.m. Eastern time slot, including one later on this afternoon, which will be lifting up um, how we can leverage the spaces, the everyday places where children and family go, children and families go, the laundromats, grocery stores, et cetera, and make them places that support children's learning and development. So our hypothesis that the predictable and reliable schedule of a session every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time would make it easier for people to make plans to join into these conversations has really proven to be true. We've seen our registration and attendance numbers continue to grow over the past year and remain um, consistently high. So I would encourage you to tune back in for this afternoon session and then again in coming weeks to join in for more GLR Learning Tuesdays sessions as we lift up um, the emerging science, best programs and ideas to support early school success for more children in low-income families. We've now hosted more than 40 webinars since the launch of GLR Learning Tuesdays, so I would also encourage you to check out the growing archive of resources from these conversations. It's posted on uh, CLIP, that's the Campaign's Community Learning for Impact and Improvement platform. Um, and we've, got, we've, we've just recently reorganized that archive, so there's now a folder for each of the conversations that we've hosted since we launched the series back in September of 2019. So it's much easier to find what it is that you're looking for. And if you're unfamiliar with CLIP, um, we're going to post a link to CLIP so that you can join and access those resources in the chat box. So keep an eye out for that. But now for today's conversation focused on family and community uh, math. And to begin that conversation, I am honored to turn it over to Ginger Young. She is a vital partner with the campaign and is supporting our uh, parent success initiative. And she's also the founder and executive director of Book Harvest in Durham, North Carolina. So thank you so much, Ginger. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm delighted to be here today and I'm just super um, uh, enthusiastic about the content we're covering uh, as a group. So thank you all for being here. I just want to take a minute to run through uh, the amazing uh, roster of speakers and presenters we have today, and then I will be turning it back over to Kimberly Brenneman and Liz Simons with the Heising Simons Foundation. Um, we do have Kimberly, in, uh, who is the, um, the Education Program Officer at Heising Simons, um, taking us through some, some framing around a family and community math as an essential part of an early learning strategy. First, though, Liz Simons, the board chair of Heising Simons Foundation, is going to give us some personal reflections and thoughts on why this matters. So after that, we're going to turn to a, a series of discussants who are going to talk about their roles with family and community math and what they're doing to promote those in their own work. Um, first, we'll have um, Omo Moses from Math Talk in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, you can advance the slide now. Um, Omo is uh, joined by Gita Pradhan, the president of Cambridge Community Foundation, a funder of um, Math Talk. Um, next up, we will have David Parker, who is with Serve Minnesota, um, vice president of research and development there, and his funding colleague, Kate Kelly, um, with PNC Bank Minnesota. And finally, to wrap up our discussant content will be Nikki Shearman, who is the um, strategic uh, Chief Strategic Officer for Reach Out and Read. Um, and after Nikki has had a chance to share her content, we will move to a Q&A session. So keep your ideas and your questions in mind. If you want to go ahead and post them at any time during the, um, the presentations in the Q&A box, we'll be tracking those. So feel free to do so. Um, now what I would like to do is share with you a little bit of info about our host for today, Kimberly Brenneman. Um, Kim is the Program Officer for Early Math at the Heising Simons Foundation. Prior to joining the foundation in 2015, she was research faculty at Rutgers University's National Institute for Early Education Research, where she led projects focused on curricular and instructional practices to foster science, technology, engineering, and math learning for young children in school and home settings. Um, as an educational consultant, 
Kim has contributed to the development of educational media resources to support preschool age children, um, math and science learners. She earned a PhD in developmental psychology from UCLA, and she completed her, under, completed her undergraduate work in psychology and Spanish at Bucknell University. Kim, thank you for kicking us off today, and um, I hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Ginger. I appreciate that kind introduction. And now I'm very excited to introduce uh, Liz Simons, who is the board chair of the Heising Simons Foundation. She's gonna provide some uh, keynote remarks uh, to, to launch our discussion of family and community math, an essential part of an early learning strategy. Uh, Liz co-founded the Heising Simons Foundation with Mark Heising in 2007, and she and Mark joined the Giving Pledge in 2016. As uh, Ginger noted, Liz is the chair of the board. Liz also serves on the board of many other um, uh, organizations. I won't list them all here. You can check them out in her bio, but a few, just some highlights, the Marshall Project, Smart Justice California, Foundation for a Just Society, and the Learning Policy Institute. Uh, Liz um, also, long before she did those things, was a preschool teacher and a teacher in Spanish bilingual and English as a second language classroom. She still volunteers in transitional kindergarten classrooms as a storyteller. She also founded Stretch to Kindergarten, which is a spring and summer early childhood education program serving children who had not had preschool experiences, helping them make that all important educational transition to kindergarten. All that's to say that Liz um, brings a deep expertise and um, deep passion for early childhood learning to her work at the foundation. So Liz, I'm so pleased to introduce you and look forward to your remarks. Okay, I'm having a bit of technical. Can you guys see me okay? There's, oh good, okay. Um, yes, so anyway, it's just an honor to be with you here today with people who care deeply about supporting young children and their learning wherever they are. And clearly that wherever they are has particular salience in this moment when children haven't been able to go to school for several months, when their families, especially the most vulnerable, are struggling with, with unemployment, with the digital divide, with, with, um, with, with, with you know, fear and stress and concern about disease. This moment feels like a more important time than ever to have um, family and community math. And it feels a bit like a hand outstretched from one generation to the next. So I, I guess I take a little bit of credit for bringing early math to our foundation. When we were looking at early childhood education some 10 years ago um, and observing quality early childhood programs, I was struck by kind of an absence of math. I mean, we saw lots of great pre-literacy activities. We saw art, we, the children were running around and having fun, but, but math seemed to be absent. And that really surprised me because as um, a child of a, of a dad who was a mathematician and a mom who later became a computer scientist, I, I realized I grew up in kind of a math milieu. And so I can't remember a time when, when I was young, when I wasn't you know, jumping around on a number line with positive and negative integers. <laughs> with, um, and I, we weren't playing math games in the car. And you know, I can't remember not just sitting around and, and talking about math. Um, so it struck me as, as odd that, um, that math was absent when, when it really ought to be part of, you know, of what children were doing in early childhood settings. So I, I actually talked to our foundation staff and I said, is this normal? Is this what we see everywhere? Not, not that much math happening in early childhood settings. And the answer is yes. It turned out at that time that only something like 3% of a typical preschool day was devoted to early math. And not only that, there was some exciting new research that at the time was just being um, put forth that, that showed that the math that a child knows in kindergarten is highly predictive of how well that child will do, not only in math, but even in reading later in school. And we know now that children who are deprived the opportunity to um, acquire foundational math skills are less likely to graduate from high school and of course much less likely to go to college. So 
to me, this is a real equity issue. And I, I know that many of you feel that way too. Um, and so our foundation really jumped on the early math bandwagon. We started supporting early math in all of its facets. We supported research. We've been supporting policy, advocacy, thinking about the educator pipeline. And you know, I think it's, I think it's actually made a difference. And um, I know that a lot of you here have also done the same. And I think that the landscape is starting to look different and we do see more math in, in early childhood settings than we used to. Um, but I have to say that I have a, a special place in my, in my heart for the family and community math because I feel that it, it brings in so many of the things that children really need. Um, we know that family engagement is a powerful predictor of how well children will do in school and in life. And we know there are specific ways that families can talk about math in, in ways that are, that are fun and, and really engaging to children. So for example, if, to if toddlers and preschoolers hear their, their parents count the things that they see around them like birds on a branch and if they do that together, we know those children are more likely to have good numerical skills in first grade. Parents who talk about shape and use spatial terms encourage their children to do the same. And those children grow up with a, with a stronger sense of geometry and space. And, and so we know that, that they, these are things that, that aren't that hard. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be done with a lot of extra effort because parents can incorporate this, these kind of math conversations and activities into their daily routines. So for example, when they're cooking, when they're driving, when they're walking in the park or reading, they can be taking the math that's all around them and, and incorporating it into what they're doing and talking about. So this has made, I should say, all the easier in communities that have embraced some truly transformative um, ways to make math a part of the community as well as the home. So you can see these really math rich environments in, in places like bus stops and laundromats and, um, you know, and just, just all around. So there, I hope that we, we will talk about some of that later in this, in this conversation. Um, and so some of all this reminds me of my childhood, but obviously parents don't have to be mathematicians to make this happen, though in a way, I think all of us are mathematicians. Math is all around us, and families are already engaging in it in ways that are meaningful and culturally relevant to them. So I think that what we want to do in our work is, is support, strengthen, and, and validate what, what families are already doing, what communities are already doing. And um, you know, it's such an exciting time. And I'm immensely grateful to our program officer, Kim Brenneman, for, for leading us in this work and, and taking us to these exciting directions, directions that I know so many of you here are, are the impetus of. So thank you so much. Liz, thank you so much for those amazing comments to start us off on this journey together today um, and beyond as we continue conversations in the future about family and community math. Um, you really set us up well, so thank you for that. Um, now I'm going to spend about 10 minutes talking with all of you about early math. What is early math? Why does it matter? What's family math and family and community math, and why do those matter for young children's learning and self-concepts and mathematics? And then finally introduce you uh, briefly to a national effort to build the field of family and community math. So what is early math? I'm going to stress that we're talking about math that's happening from birth zero to three, zero to age five, zero to age eight, all of those start with zero. We are talking about children learning math before they go to school and thinking mathematically from birth. Um, early math is relevant to young children's lives. It's critical to them um, and critical for their future learning as Liz mentioned in her remarks. And it's fun. Children haven't learned yet that math is boring. Um, and it's fun for every child. We have unfortunately some stereotypes in our culture that are really damaging about who does mathematics. Um, every child comes into the world thinking mathematically, 
and excited to continue their learning in mathematics. You just have to spend time with a young child to know this and to see this. They enjoy counting the steps they're taking. They like to compare who's faster, who's stronger, who's taller, who's older. That's measurement. Um, they're thinking about patterns. If you try um, to skip, say, um, singing that song before bed as part of the bedtime routine, um, they're going to tell you about it. They've noticed that pattern, and that's mathematical. Um, they will definitely um, be a tending to how many cookies they get versus how many cookies their sister gets. And if those aren't the same in their opinion, they will let you know. They're paying attention to more and less. Um, early math um, in this way is very connected to language, literacy, and social emotional development, as well as other areas, critical areas of, of children's early learning and development. Um, thinking about to that um, example I just gave about cookies and what's fair, I mean, we really see children's early uh, ideas of fairness and justice arising out of their attention to who has what and who has more of different things. So um, these are all intimately related and we support children's general learning and development when we support their early math development and vice versa. Language, I mean, sorry, mathematics is a language. It is a way of describing the world and like other languages, it develops from birth and we can work to help it develop from birth. Um, also, the earlier children have the opportunity to be exposed to mathematical talk and mathematical reasoning and thinking and activities and play, um, the easier it is for them to learn that math language and to become fluent in it. Um, the next slide tells us um, a little bit about why we should care about early math. Why does early math matter? As Liz related in her remarks, uh, research is telling us that um, early math, how much you know when you're in kindergarten, your skills then, but also how much you grow in those early years in your math um, skills and knowledge really is related to how well you do in math and reading and science later in elementary school. It's related to your math skills in high school, which is again then related to um, going to college and college completion and so on. So early math um, unlocks uh, early uh, long-term school and life success. We also know that um, children arrive at school uh, with differing skills, um, and we know that um, certain demographic groups of children have been kept from um, learning proficiency, um, children of color, children learning multiple languages in their homes, children whose families are experiencing economic hardship, um, arrive, often arrive at school um, with skills that differ from those of their um, white and upper middle class peers. Let's be very clear, um, a lot of that is the artifact of um, bias measurement. It's an artifact of what we value in school, um, rather than looking at the brilliance of all children in mathematics. But we also know that of the things that we measure when children get to school, school doesn't fix the early disparities that we find. They are maintained uh, throughout schooling. So if we can fix those earlier and before they even start, um, we stand children in good stead of becoming proficient. Finally, um, we know just like early learning more generally and the opportunity to have um, early, uh, early education, equitable math uh, learning, benefits the individual, certainly in the ways that we describe, but it also benefits our society from a moral perspective, from an economic perspective, investment in early math learning for young children is going to benefit um, us more generally. So where do families fit into this and where does family math fit into this effort to prepare children well for school and for early school success? Um, certainly as we're talking about children before they head to school, who are they spending time with? They're spending time with their parents, with their extended family members, friends and community members. These are their family. Um, we're using an expansive um, definition there. The people who participate in children's development and their early math skills and help them with their early math thinking both at home and the community. For family math, we're thinking about um, activities that generally happen outside of school, although they might happen inside of school, an aftercare program and a family math night with a community member who comes in and does tutoring. So we're talking about family and community math as something different than um, formal instruction by a teacher. It happens in the context of family relationships, out in the community, in everyday life settings and everyday life activities. And family math supports young children and their families to strengthen their math concepts, but also their math awareness. It helps them understand what they're already doing that is mathematical um, and what they could do more of to, to further their own skills and their children's skills. 
We want children through family math to feel enthusiastic and confident about their own abilities, and we want them to develop strong math identities. Research is clear that math anxiety can negatively affect achievement. Um, children, generally speaking, need to develop that anxiety and learn it. So we want to make sure, and we think that family math is a way that we can um, head that off and have children feel confident about themselves as math learners. We hope that through family math efforts, um, families will come to understand and use resources that will help them improve their children's understanding of math concepts. I want to put a corollary on that point. Um, it's really important as we think about efforts to, de to develop resources and to develop programs for family and community math that we want family members and community members co-designing those things with us. We want to make sure that their, their needs, their strengths, um, their concerns are are um, part of the co-design of resources for family and community math and that we can lift up the things that families are already doing and share those with other families through the resources and programs that we develop. Um, why does family math matter? Uh, the next slide please. Well I mean no one cares more for a child's success than their family. If we're not leveraging that power, that love, that motivation to support young children, we're missing um, a really important or some really important allies in, in early math learning. We also know that children spend a lot of time in school, but they spend much more time outside of school learning in their homes and in their communities. So by leveraging that time and those spaces as opportunities for math learning, we are going to support children. Um, families are a largely untapped resource. I think that's been pretty clear through, through, these co through my comments that um, families aren't always aware um, that they're doing math. They're also not always aware of the importance of early math. No one needs to convince them that math matters for their children and it matters for success. They just often think of it as something that happens in school or can wait for school. When families hear about the importance of early math for later learning, they, they're right on board and they wanna know what they can do and what they can do more of to support their children. We also know, as Liz was uh, um, mentioning in her remarks, that there are specific ways that families can talk with their children and activities that they can do that research tells us are contributing to positive learning and positive attitudes. For example, new research coming out finds that preschoolers whose parents um, report engaging in more block building, games, um, reading of books that have math content in them with their children, have children who learn more math in the preschool year over and above what they learn just through sort of rote um, learning of counting lists and rote wrote facts. So those playful, interactive activities that, that parents do with their children really do influence positively children's math skills. We want very much through family math, and it's really important to leverage that family and community expertise because we believe that we can address early math disparities even before they form and before children get to school. So finally, my last slide, and then we'll get to our panelists, which will be really exciting. I just wanted to briefly introduce those of you who aren't aware of it, of an effort um, to build the field of early math um, in uh, partnership with the Overdeck Family Foundation, Education First, many other funding organizations and stakeholders, practitioners, researchers, policy and advocacy folks across the country. We are working towards a goal in, of all children and families, regardless of their background, having access to culturally responsive math opportunities for every child to achieve mathematical proficiency that is their right. Um, we're doing this by building a field of early math. We knew that um, as a field, we lacked the coherence and unity to really lift that proficiency and to address the systemic challenges that are facing many families in this country. So together, we're working to ensure that we're learning from the practices that are happening in the field like those that are being undertaken by our panelists to increase family understanding and community member understanding of the use of home and community practices that will support young children's learning. We want to make sure that our research is co-constructed in a culturally responsive way, that our measures and methodologies are culturally responsive and as unbiased as possible. We want to ensure that policymakers and advocates are really um, uh, promoting parent leadership and providing funding for family and community math and family and community learning. We want to make sure we're linking what we're trying to do in math to other early learning efforts, which is why we're here talking with the amazing GLR network today. Um, 
we also want to work towards a future, and we're, we're in the process of this, we've been at it for two or three years, in which family math as a field has the infrastructure resources and capacity in place to support a coordinated and coherent effort at the local, regional, and national levels. And again, that's why we're here speaking with you today to learn from you, learn with you, and leverage um, your uh, particular knowledge of the communities that you uh, work in and live in. So now I'd love to share with all of you um, three case studies. Um, Mass Talk is the first case study we'll talk about. Then we'll hear from the folks at Serve Minnesota and finally talk with Mickey Shearman from Reach Out and Read. And we're going to give you sort of a flavor of some of the family and community math work that's happening uh, across the country right now. So let's start with um, Math Talk. We have um, Omo Moses, who's the founder and CEO of MathDoc, a community-based ed tech startup founded in 2015. Prior to um, that, Omo was the executive director and a founding member of the Young People's Project, which is a national nonprofit organization that utilizes mathematics to prepare students for school and for life. Omo is also a proud father of math learners, Jahari and Kamara. Uh, almost joined today by um, Gita Pradhan, who is the president of the Cambridge Community Foundation, um, a, a philanthropist of long standing. Gita previously worked at the Boston Foundation. She also um, has degrees in urban planning and economic development. She brings those strengths and expertise to her work at the foundation. Cambridge Community Foundation is 103 years old and it supports approximately 150 nonprofits annually. So pleased to have um, Omo and Gita here with us today to talk about their partnership around Math Talk. So first question for you, Omo, can you tell us a little bit about Math Talk? Yeah, thanks, Kim, um, and thanks to the campaign for having me. Um, and so, yeah, when I think about math, similar to Liz, I think about my family. Um, and so over the years, math has meant a lot of things. Um, in the beginning, math was freedom. So as a kid, I couldn't go outside unless I finished my math lessons. Um, and math was also really rewarding. And so, um, you know, I have vivid experiences of doing well in school, of taking the algebra one test in eighth grade and understand like what that meant for myself as a person and my own trajectory. Um, math has always been important. Um, my dad would often say that if your friends don't get this algebra, then they're gonna end up in jail. And as a kid or as a teenager, that felt like a huge leap. Um, but as I you know, grew up, I began to understand what he was talking about. And so my family, um, kind of, you know, was, grew out of the civil rights movement. Um, my mom and dad met in Mississippi during the 60s. And um, my dad always kind of made the connection between, you know, sharecroppers earning the right to vote in Mississippi in the 60s and young people learning math today, which again, for me, was a huge leap. Um, but this idea of mathematics being a key to citizenship, particularly, as the economy has shifted and you know there became a high premium on uh, math literacy in addition to other literacies um, my first work experiences were teaching math um, and so i experienced it as a high school student as a college student and post-college working in the community in the classroom and understand some of the challenges related to that one of the things that um, was really beneficial and this um, really grew out of my experience working with the algebra project was really learning about math um, in context and so the idea that math really is a language and that you can ground math in common languages you can ground it in community and common experiences um, have really informed how i think about family math and how i think about math with my kids and so one of the um, things that math wasn't was it wasn't fun when I was a kid. And so um, when I became a dad, I became determined to make it something that um, my son and I and my daughter and I enjoyed doing. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Would you two like to share what you're doing? 
So I am measuring and seeing what if which is bigger between the panda bear, a polar bear, and the grizzly bear. And I found out that the polar bear is the biggest. All right. Can you show us your animals first? Now you can see them. I have a polar bear, a grizzly bear, one polar yeah. bear, one grizzly bear, yeah, one well, panda bear. Not that. What about that? Alright, we'll start at 10. You got 10 rows of 6. How many is that? 10 rows of 6? 60. Alright, then you got 2 more rows. 66, 72. How many polar bears in the yard? 72. Approximately. Amara, you standing up against the wall? Yeah. Want to see how many apples tall she is? 9, 10, 11, about 11 and a half apples. What? Cool. All right, now let me do inches. How many inches do you think are 11 and a half apples? Want, 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 want. 41 inches. We're going to the alley. Let's see what we're going to get here. What do you got? How many in the counters? It's a one and a three. What number is that? Can you see them? Yes. <laughs> How many I got? Looks like 13 anacondas. Whoa. Now what? Um, you're all set. You can go in the house. And watch? Yeah. And so, next slide. Yeah, so for me as a dad, I've really um, spent a lot of time over the last couple of years exploring um, how to activate the math that's all around us. And we've looked at ways in which you can use your physical environment and also integrate technology into it to um, make it visible. And so, you know, I love this idea of kids really developing a math lens and really being able to step out into the world and begin to recognize and see math um, just all around them and feel confident and comfortable in exploring that um, and to make it something that they enjoy doing. And so we've looked at really two kind of interventions or developing two types of products that are integrated. One um, is a physical kind of experience that has a presence in a neighborhood or community. And so the gigantic number line is an installation that we created that lives in a public park, um, but you can imagine similar things in school playgrounds. Um, as people talked about earlier, you know, we've developed stuff that you can um, put in bus stops or put in health center waiting rooms. Um, and I think the whole idea, um, you know, is to really just activate a space and to create um, a presence. And so when I visit this park, um, you know, it becomes clear that math is there and it helps people engage in the math that's around them. And so we've used that as well as digital technology. I think, um, you know, the technology is exciting. I think there's an opportunity to blend um, both physical and digital spaces and to really um, reimagine what screen time can look like um, instead of being kind of isolated in a device, um, the device becomes kind of a tool to explore the world around you. And so I've had, um, you can change to the next slide. Um, over the last couple years, you know, we've spent a lot of time really thinking about what these products can look like. And I think the general idea um, for me has been, um, you know, it's personal in that I've tried to um, involve my kids in this experience as they're going into more formal schooling and as they're growing up um, and really, you know, coming up with creative ways to learn mathematics, but then to find ways to make that replicable and to share that with other families. And so, um, you know, this began, um, you can go to the next slide, um, really in conversations and the conversations happen at the community level and um, Gita at the Cambridge Community Foundation was one of the first people that I talked to about this idea. And um, it was really powerful just being able to kind of walk in her office and, you know, she'd wave and I didn't have an appointment or a meeting. 
Um, but I just kind of walk in and then begin having a conversation about some of the stuff that I was thinking about. And, um, you know, it was really an early idea that um, I needed to get people excited about and invested in. Um, and so the foundation was one of those first groups locally that helped to do that. And as I was having the conversation at the local level, um, I was also having this conversation with Kim. And similarly, um, you know, it felt like Kim and the foundation were really open to exploring an idea with me and to um, really testing something out. And so over a couple years, this image right here, um, I think is indicative of, you know, hundreds of conversations that have happened at the community level um, that, you know, involve people, um, all the early childhood stakeholders, and just thinking about what it would could look like if we activated the spaces around us and we created resources for early math learning in the community um, and involved families in that process. And so um, the last slide, please. Um, I think the overriding question for me has always been kind of a what if. Um, and, you know, what if, and this is actually the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, the Port neighborhood in Cambridge, but what if this neighborhood were saturated with touch points for positive early math learning? Like, what would it mean for a kid growing up in this community to be able to move through this community and um, the mathematics would be unavoidable and there are always different ways for them to see it and interact with it. And part of the reality, I think the broader issue that has also driven me is that um, the neighborhood I grew up in is surrounded by M MIT, it's surrounded by the biotech industry, surrounded by Google, Facebook, all those folks. And as a kid, um, you know, I didn't see those spaces as opportunities for me and I know um, you know, 25, 30 years later, the kids growing up in that, in this neighborhood don't see those um, opportunities that they're surrounded by. And mathematics is at the core of um, helping, you know, young people be able to tap into the existing economic opportunities and to be um, creators kind of in the economy and to be able to um, you know, um, raise money and to sustain a family. And so I think in addition to just thinking about, you know, would it be nice and wonderful for kids to be able to have these experiences? I think there's always the overlying issue that just looks at what are the outcomes, um, particularly for African American and Latino kids, you know, what are the outcomes for them if they don't get access to mathematics at an early age. And um, just going back to what my dad was saying, this idea that if you don't get this algebra, you know, you're gonna, your friends are gonna end up in jail. I mean, that was the reality. And so, um, you know, I'll turn it over to Gita, but I feel like part of this effort is just really, ex ex in, um, really inspiring uh, a new generation of learners that see mathematics as something that's part of them, that's part of their culture and part of their community. Thanks so much for that, Omar. I really appreciate um, the personal um, background that you bring and the, the personal passion uh, from your family for family math. Gita, um, I'd love to hear from you. Omar mentioned how powerful it was for him to be able to walk into your office and talk with you about his ideas. I'd love to hear from you um, what resonated for you with what Math Talk is all about and why community, Cambridge Community Foundation decided to be an early investor in the work. Unmute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't realize I was on mute. <laughs> um, but I wanted to first say a huge thank you to uh, Kim and Liz um, for putting this together for what you said, because I think in your remarks, you both talked about the importance of equity and the importance of um, uh, cultural sensitivity in how and, and cultural stereotypes as we do work in the community to change outcomes in the community 
my background has been mostly in the field of community development. So when Omar walked into my office to talk about this idea, you know, it suddenly sort of my eyes lit up because all the things that I had struggled with and thought about, um, you know, about why this persistent economic equities, why is it that 30 years of work in the community and I still saw the same outcomes uh, continue, that what was the one thing that we could do that could really sort of change the outcomes. And for me, it was this connection of the importance of financial literacy, math, um, and early, early uh, investments in this and the um, relationship with uh, issues of economic equity. I would say that, you know, um, and to top that all, actually, it was a Cambridge context. I mean, if you know anything about Cambridge, it is both an innovation city and it's a university town. And when we look at educational outcomes um, for our children in the Cambridge public schools, right from third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, 10th grade, into college, into life, you see these persistent inequities um, in, in um, educational outcomes, which then leads to persistent inequities in economic outcomes. Um, and I, I thought it was sort of a shame, you know, that a city like Cambridge uh, has those kinds of inequities. Uh, we really should not um, have that. And then I would say, you know, the, um, I think one of the things that I learned through my work over the years is the, is that, you know, and, and it's sort of coming to bear right now in the COVID era, post COVID or COVID era, and the racial justice and racial inequity issues is the relationship between power and wealth. No matter what we might say, those are very, very powerful connections. When you are powerful, you get your voice heard. When you are down, you know, struggling with life, um, it is difficult, not only is it difficult, but there is, society has created this imbalance and it's not just in America, it's throughout the world. If you are powerful, you could be, well, there's an example I think we have right now in the White House. If you are wealthy, you have a lot more power. So, um, I'm actually really driven by this issue of looking at how you change um, the economic imbalance in this um, country and definitely in our city, you know, which is much more where I'm focused on. And I want to share a few, um, you know, uh, data points with you. There was a very interesting um, presentation that the Urban Institute working, I think, with Presky or Kellogg had put together um, about the, uh, you know, um, persistent inequities in this country. And um, so I want to just share some data points with you. You, did, you know, over the last 50 years, incomes of high income households grew 90% and incomes of low income households grew only 10%. Um, the fact that um, over a 60 year period, you know, we all think of the fact that our children will be able to do better than us. But if you look at the history of the past 60 years, what we are seeing is that the percentage of children earning more than their parents has dropped by 40%. So, you know, there's, you're seeing this, this difference and this shift. And then you look at federal subsidies for wealth creation and who do they favor? They favor the wealthy, mortgage interest deductions, property tax deductions, employer sponsored retirement plans that, you know, the more you earn, the more you get. Um, IRAs and the like. And the only exception is savers credit, which is really a minuscule, minuscule portion of wealth creation. So, you know, the importance of looking at instruments and capacities to create wealth. And I look at a place like Cambridge, you know, with the innovation economy and a university education economy, the best jobs, the best, the most high paying jobs are going to people who have those educational capacities and skills. And if you don't have it, then you're relegated to jobs like security and janitorial positions, which is where I'm seeing a lot of people of color in the uh, Cambridge innovation economy. And then the last thing that I want to mention in terms of data is the racial disparities in wealth um, that have grown with a differential of almost what a white uh, household earns is seven times more than what a black household earns. But I think most shocking to me was um, this piece of research that was done by the Boston Federal Reserve Bank in 2015 that looked at net worth of white households versus households of color. 
the net worth of a white household was $276,000 at the average net worth. And the average net worth of a black household was eight, the single digit $8. And we know that there are many households that have negative income. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, this, this, as this in the importance of education and math um, and lit, uh, literacy, you know, um, I, I think it is fundamental to changing any of these outcomes because we are, I'm finding in the work that we are doing that, uh, you know, kids don't go into science and technology careers because they haven't done pre-algebra. They haven't done pre-algebra because they, there was this stereotype and this fear of math and science, and that comes from the fact that their parents might have been afraid of math and science. So I think the importance of family math, the importance of investing early is really, really critical. And I just love what Omo has been able to do, you know, where you can go into a barber shop and you can measure your height and you can measure the distances or you can go into a park or a playground or the street or the bus stop making it a part of everyday life. Thank you so much for your perspective. I uh, appreciate it so much. I'm gonna now move us on to our second case study. I am excited to welcome um, David Parker, the Vice President of Research and Development for Serve Minnesota to talk with us about that program. He's joined by Kay Kelly, who's the Executive Vice President and Regional President for PNC Bank Minnesota and um, a board member of Serve Minnesota. So excited to have you here. So first question, one that won't surprise you, tell us about Serve, tell us about Serve Minnesota and your work in early learning, math specifically. Yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah, what is what is our big idea? But before I say that, I, I think I maybe shouldn't admit this, but I'm pretty sure I would have gotten that bear question wrong. <laughs> I, you know, there's nothing like early childhood to keep you humble um, and and expose what you 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 just don't know even as an adult. Um, but I, I'll start by maybe going back to Kim your broad definition of family um, and saying you know we really appreciate that from our seat kind of in the AmeriCorps community kind of perspective. And that's really where we're situated. So if you go to the next slide, we want to just start with the big idea, which is AmeriCorps and community are, are, are essentially synonymous. We exist as a funder to be able to provide individuals within their communities, wherever they're at, opportunities to have you know, the tools and experiences and support to give back to those communities. Um, and for those who may not know about AmeriCorps, it's, it's not volunteering, it's, it's, it's service is what we call it. And that's because people are giving a half, you know, time or a full-time commitment for a full year of their lives to give back to their communities. And so that's kind of the resource that we're kind of, we're sitting on as a funder. So if you go to the next slide, I want to just quickly set up how we approach our role with access to that resource. So what you see here is kind of a simple marrying of service, as I just define it, which is the AmeriCorps with science. And what I would, I would maybe encourage folks to think of this as the marrying of know-how with how-to. So the AmeriCorps kind of catch line is we're going to get things done. So there's a really clear focus on, on doing, but not just doing, you know, doing things that are gonna make an impact. And so that's where Serve Minnesota's role as this community organization that can leverage AmeriCorps, thinks of science um, and know-how in a very broad sense, right? So it's, it's, it's things that, that kind, of, kind of come to mind when you think science directly, like maybe kind of a, a research paper on what's gonna to work to help students improve outcome X. Um, it's using data, but it's also parts of the scientific process that have to be included as well, like a robust approach to making sure that communities that are gonna be participating in, in delivering and receiving and giving um, a program to support an issue area, they have a voice and they help kind of craft the program and make sure that it's really a need um, and it's really fitting and meeting that need. In addition to things like making sure that the content that the AmeriCorps member with this training to help an issue area is able to deliver with a culturally inclusive and representative manner. So that's all science. That's a broad definition of science to match this broad definition of, of family. So if you go to the next slide, that's 
that's the setup for this this infrastructure that that we have and we've been able to kind of fortunately kind of prove that concept at a pretty big scale because wherever you see a little red dot in our in our good northern state of minnesota you have a community member who is placed in their local school or educational center and they're taking those tools uh, that we as a community, as, as Serve Minnesota, are able to kind of work with our programs and ensure they have. And they are leveraging those tools day in and day out in their schools to help students uh, improve their learning outcomes. In this case, it's our reading network. And I just want to point out that that idea has, has, has gotten national attraction. So on the map below that, you see a little person. You may not be able to see it clearly, but there's a little flying <laughs> book person. That little flying book person is 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 doing the same thing in terms of the dots spreading out across the state as we've been able to do in Minnesota. In some cases, it's already kind of exceeding the rate of expansion. So this idea of using AmeriCorps members as as community members within a community to give back to the community in an issue is really taking root. And if you click the slide, it's not just scaling that we have been a party to and that we're just so excited about in terms of a community's potential. It's actually impact too. So there's both a scaling and an impact element. So those of you, this is this is where we probably got connected with the campaign for grade level reading, right? We have some some fairly common and important early literacy skills that just have to be in place for future learning success and future literacy. And when that AmeriCorps member brings their tools into the schools and is able to work to collaboratively improve learning outcomes and literacy, all three of these things go up. Um, more so than when the school doesn't have access to that AmeriCorps member, right? And that's been, that's been shown in multiple studies by third parties using the most rigorous methodology to kind of show like impact evidence. So that's a really great starting point in terms of a network. And if you click to the next slide, slide that's the big idea of background context that I think, and I have to let Kate kind of speak for herself here, but I think that's what the, 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 my colleague Kate, who saw with, who represents PNC and has their own robust early childhood commitment, they saw that infrastructure and said, we have something here. What if, what if and this is where the math comes in, we could add math to that and could we support you in do, doing that? So I'll pause here and see if Kate wants to kind of share her perspective. Oh, thank you, David. And um, what a pleasure to be with all of you. So thank you for inviting us. David, I, I think we, I speak for both of us, but I feel like we're with our peeps at this group. So this is wonderful. Um, but as David mentioned, where PNC Bank came into the picture is that Minneapolis and Minnesota was an expansion market for PNC in 2017. I had been on the CERB Minnesota board probably since 2004 or five, a long time, and I'm currently the board chair, chairperson. So as I tell everybody, I speak more about maybe this than I have in my career about banking. It's just in my bones and for good reason. And so when we came, when PNC came into the market, when I joined them in 2017, we quickly came to the community and really wanted to move the needle, be part of the community and, and apply our philanthropic efforts immediately. And when we did that, PNC, as many of you might know, has a program, a philanthropic uh, program called Grow Up Great. And they've been doing this for over 15 years, and we have invested over, I think, 500 million or so in the, that time frame. So we wanted to not only do what's right for the community in Minneapolis and the entire state of Minnesota, but we wanted to be aligned with where PNC's resources were naturally um, suited. And that would be in the pre-K space. So Grow Up Great focuses on birth to five-year-olds and in the early ed. Our philosophy is that um, we want to set kids out on the right trajectory in education and in life. And so we do a lot of volunteering, our, our philanthropic dollars, and everything kind of rallies around that. So this was a perfect alignment. So with my knowledge of Serve Minnesota, I just have such a great faith in the credibility of the organization. It's really a research to practice um, discipline that we have, as David mentioned. So when we looked at that and what we do in the pre-K space, maybe partnering with Serve Minnesota, we looked at our math program and we had really focused at fourth to eighth grade for Serve Minnesota. And, and really, we always knew a lot, I mean, that was a great, it is a great program, but it's catching kids and students too late. So I wonder if we move that math into the pre-K space, catch children super early, um, work with partners in the community. Um, let's say PNC is going to help go from birth to uh, kindergarten or five years old. And like right now, we're working with Cargill Foundation. They're going to pick it up at kindergarten and take it to third grade. 
So if we start kids early, connect the dots, really um, bring in that philanthropic um, private, um, private money coupled with the leverage points of Serve Minnesota and the federal dollars, we'd really have something going on. Catching kids early, having that continuum, building their confidence on top of the math skills is really kind of what we set out to do and have had great results. So if we can go to the next slide, um, you can see why this was compelling to us when we started to look at this. Um, this is a slide with the circles. And this is kind of a sad slide, but this is really what caught our attention once we started looking at it. And the, on the top side, you see a kind of a slide from third, sixth to 11th grade on the test scores. And if you look below that line, it, then you kind of look at it from a school standpoint that have free and reduced price lunches, and it's even more devastating. So we thought we're spot on, and that's why we're so spot on as a community on this whole panel today. It's um, where we need to go. If you want to go to the next slide, um, so I explained where PNC became involved in when I was 17. So in the last few years, we've probably committed about a million, a little over a million dollars to serve Minnesota and a few other community partners around this early math concept. So we came in and allowed and gave dollars to allowed us to pilot, to experiment, get the curriculum going. We already had the reading programs in the pre-K space. We just needed to add the math into those programs. And once we did that, now now we're in a, this year we're going to go to scale so we might have started with maybe uh, five sites 100 students just to get it going we built to 50 sites and uh, i think a thousand students so at the end of this year we're going to full scale and that will be going to 200 sites and 7500 students and not only full scale in minnesota which means metro and rural areas but it would be in the states that david um, identified on the map which is so exciting so that takes us from the private dollars helping out, getting the wheels going on the piloting um, in that left box. And then when you go to the middle, we're experimenting and that's where we are, we're going to scale. Then when you go to the third one, that's where we can leverage within the AmeriCorps structure, the federal dollars, because now we have mature programs with the credibility, we can get AmeriCorps on the ground and that's where we can leverage up. So then we're off and running and it has a sustainability factor. So here we have an engine that has that research to practice. It has leverage points of federal dollars and AmeriCorps people power on the, on the ground. And then you have that sustainability. You really have a nice three-legged stool. So this is an exciting moment to be talking about it. And um, we're excited about the next phase of going to scale. And then you can go to the next slide. And David, I'll let you pick up here. Oh, sure. Yeah. So you saw we define science broadly, but, you know, this is straight out of the, the playbook of, of science and studies. So we just wanted to share one example of how we've been able to, through that incredible and appreciated investment from PNC, create a program that improves math outcomes in an equitable way. So this is some data from uh, one of the years that we've implemented the program, and we started with an equitable kind of inclusion of sites who express the most need. Um, and the most interest in having this partnership where our AmeriCorps members did math. And I just, I, well, what we want to point out here is just what those lines do. Look at those programs that, that the, the schools that had this, this math program that was kind of made possible by this partnership. In the fall, 29% of the students were meeting, you know, pre-K age level math benchmarks. And yes, those outcomes weren't good enough for the comparison schools who were relatively more well-resourced, um, but it was significantly greater than the schools in which we were working. And then the thing that was really exciting for us from an equitable impact and just an impact in general lens was what happened by the end of the year. And I think that kind of speaks for itself, but I'll just kind of do the voiceover so it's really, really clear and what we're excited about. That is we, we not only caught, but we started, we got kids on uh, to exceed um, the percentages of students who were, who were meeting that benchmark by the end. Um, from the comparison schools. So we caught up um, together. We were able to kind of help students catch up uh, at that school level. So we're really excited about it. The work continues, like Kate said, um, and we really appreciate being a part of this. Uh, this, this Thank you so much, David and Kate. I really um, appreciate you ending there on such a positive note, right? Being able to um, in, get federal funding, uh, public funding for this work, and then also this um, 
slide that shows the power of what you're doing for children. Um, much appreciated and thank you. Now we'll move on to our third case study. Um, I'm excited to introduce or reintroduce Nikki Sherman, who's the Chief Strategic Officer for Reach Out and Read. She coordinates strategy for research and evaluation to demonstrate Reach Out and Read's impact, and she's responsible for guiding the planning process to build Reach Out and Read's new strategic roadmap next chapter. So Nikki, so happy to have you here with us to talk with us about Reach Out and Read and specifically about Reach Out and Read Counts. Thank you, Kim, and, and thank you everyone for these amazing presentations. This is such an exciting conversation. Um, if we can move to the first slide. The next slide. Yeah, thank you. So just to quickly go back on what Liz, Liz Simons was talking about, about the fun, having fun in a family um, and how math fits into that. We know that positive childhood experiences define the trajectory of a young child's life. And those parent engagement, the, the, the language rich interactions between parents and caregivers and their young children have so many downstream effects in cognitive development, early math, early literacy, um, social emotional development and, and reach out and read is, is working on that area. Um, trying to reach children at a young age, starting right from zero, as Kim said, um, we are approaching that through working through pediatric primary care. So um, pediatricians and family physicians have population level access to children in the critical early years. It's a way of reaching every child in every community. And they also have a trusted relationship between clinicians and families um, that um, hopefully means that when they give advice and guidance, um, the family um, can trust that advice. And so Reach Out and Read sits within pediatric primary care. Um, we have a simple model of promotion of positive language-rich parent or caregiver child interactions through early literacy. Um, and we have foundational integration into millions of routine well-child visits across the US. We have a deep connection within pediatric primary care and implementation at thousands of medical clinics. And we have a proven scalable infrastructure of support for clinicians that ensures fidelity of practice and connection with the community. The next slide, please, shows our model um, at routine health checkups from infancy through five years reach out and retrain doctors and nurse practitioners. They talk with families about how important it is to read aloud and engage with their young children and, and encourage families to cuddle up and read together at home and build routines around books. They also model how to look at books and talk about the stories with their infants, toddlers and preschoolers. And then they give them a new book, which is developmentally and culturally appropriate to the child to take home, keep and read with the family. The next slide, please. And just to quickly say that we have um, extensive peer reviewed research over the years that shows that parents are more likely to read to their children, more likely to read to their children more often, to enjoy reading together, and that children's language development is improved after families have been exposed to reach out and read. Next slide, please. So to talk about early math, let's think about early math in the context of reach out and read. Um, Kim um, Brenneman from Heising Simons Foundation has worked with us for a few years now, looking at how do you bring early math into shared reading? It's actually quite easy because sharing books together, you can incorporate math into that, into that context. Our aim was to introduce math talk into shared reading, encouraging joyful interactions between parents and children. We wanted to give parents another avenue to explore when sharing books with their children, linking the early literacy and the early math. We know that they have, they bounce off one another and support one another. And then also to reduce parental math anxiety to show parents that um, they're doing math already in the home. And this is not something that's difficult. It's something that they can do with their family to support their children's very early learning. Next slide, please. 
So we chose four areas of focus that we thought were simple, something that was simple for pediatricians to remember as they were talking with families, and then also something for families that was easy to remember. So starting off with counting and pointing in books, and then looking at quantities, then going on to comparisons, and then finally ending up with using books to support prediction and, and those um, skills in prediction, such as what happens at the end of the book or what do you think happens on the next page, those sorts of questions. Next slide, please. So we created an online training for uh, Reach Out and Read um, providers um, that included um, what is Math Talk? Why introduce Math Talk to families? And how math starts early? All the things that everyone on this call has already been talking about. And we provided um, guidance on how to introduce early math concepts at different developmental stages. And we have a range of videos that model this so that providers can take this training and then feel confident about talking about early math with their families as part of preventive well child care. And we also suggest books that could be used. Um, um, we say that actually you don't need a special book, you can do math in any book, but then there are also some wonderful math books out there. And some of our providers said they actually liked the math book because it reminded them to talk about math. I'd like to show um, one of the videos that we have used that demonstrate early math. Hi guys, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, what's new, Nicholas? Here for three. You're here for your three-year-old visit? Gosh, you're such yeah, a good boy now. Yeah. Okay. I brought some books to show you. Do you want to look at a book together? Yeah. Okay. So I have this book. What do you think that is on the cover? An elephant will have toys. An elephant with some toys. Good job. So when, um, and I know you guys, we've already talked about this, and I'm sure you guys are doing it at home, but when we read the story, we like to talk a lot about it, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this one in comparison to this one. This one is a little bit small. This one is a little small. This one is a little small. This one is a little big. Yeah, so <laughs> these ones are small, and this one is bigger. Good job. That was awesome. Do you want to look at the dinosaur book? Mm-hmm. Now, who do you think up. is taller, the monkey or the dinosaur? The dinosaur is too tall. He's so tall. Good <laughs> job. He's taller than the monkey. So that's the kind of thing that we recommend doing at home, right? Lots of asking questions about the story and lots of praising, right? Great job every time. We really try to avoid no, no, no if it's not correct, but kind of talking about what makes you think it's like that. These kind of comparisons are things you can even do when you're out at the store. For example, you know, what's heavier, the watermelon or the apple? Mm -hmm. Or who's taller, daddy or your little sister? And it's something that you can practice all the time, even mm -hmm. when you're not trying to sit down and make it a, an activity. Thank you. So that was a video that would show a provider how to talk about comparison uh, using a, a book. Can I have the next slide, please? And then we also created supporting materials for parents and providers, stickers, bookmarks, um, overviews of math development for the providers and posters for the clinics. And so then we have now a, an early math um, intervention that's part of uh, well child care that we can um, spread throughout. So um, Kim, I think we just wanted to finish off by talking about how do we now get this to go out local after we've had some amazing funding for National Center to set this up. Yeah, that would be great, Nikki. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, actually, I forgot this slide. This slide was what we learned. And we, this is important because we did do a lot of feedback. Um, and um, what we, we had some provider focus groups and our providers were very excited about this, uniformly enthusiastic um, and believed in the benefits for children and families 
uh, and found that it was integrated smoothly into the clinic flow. And we also did a um, parent survey. We had 813 pre-surveys, a few less post-surveys because COVID-19 broke out and you know what happened there. Um, but anyway, still a fair number of surveys. And we found that families in fact did early math when sharing books, such as counting, comparing and predicting more after exposure to reach out and read counts. And then the next slide shows that we are all over the map. We're um, in very many places in the United States. And the next slide, please. Shows that we serve 4.8 million children each year with 34,000 medical providers giving out 7.4 million books. And so um, there is an opportunity here for us to now go out into the communities and make sure that um, all children in all communities get that foundational start um, when they go to their pediatric healthcare um, visits, um, they can be given a book and they'll be encouraged to share that book and engage over that book and include early math when reading that book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Appreciate you sharing the um, sort of the, the story of Reach Out and Read and how Reach Out and Read has incorporated early math guidance into its very successful model. I'm going to now turn, uh, turn us back over to Ginger, who's going to lead our Q&A, our discussion. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, discussants. That was just a marvelous uh, session, and we do have a little time for questions and discussion. I want to lead this off with um with one group that i know is heavily represented in this in this uh, audience today we've heard today from corporate foundations private foundations and community foundations another group that has been a big leverage point and co-investment strategist in this world is united ways and so today we're very fortunate that kicking off our questions and discussion are frankie baines the regional network director and stephanie rokic the senior director of volunteer strategy at United Way of Salt Lake City. In particular, we're interested in hearing from them because United Way of Salt Lake City was a GLR 2018 pace setter around reading proficiency and math proficiency. So I'm gonna ask Frankie and Stephanie to, to open up our questions and discussion with a few brief comments. Welcome to you both. Um, thank you so much for having us um, comment. Um, it's been wonderful to listen to everyone um, share the work that they're doing and it's been really energizing and I've been taking a lot of good notes. So if we're just to share anything and comment on anything about what we're doing is um, we've been really blessed to have wonderful funders who are energized to support our students in our schools. And we started with an eighth grade math initiative that did that. And they worked in schools and did tutoring and now with COVID-19 we've taken that work into an elementary school and I'll have Stephanie share a little bit about that. Awesome thank you Frankie. So we started a virtual tutoring program this summer we're piloting it with one elementary school and the awesome thing is we've been able to work with local libraries to access some of their programs and curriculum online and we've been doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring over Zoom um, it's been going really well. The teachers and principal have been figuring out what lesson plans the students can use. And then we've been connecting to students right there in their home. We'll be expanding this in the fall and we'll actually be working with all third graders in this one school. So about 60 students will have a tutor to work one-on-one -on -one, and they'll be using a certain math program in their school or if they're home. And then we'll connect them with tutors to be able to practice those maths. So we're really excited about where this will go. Thank you. Thank you both. That's terrific um, and really good to hear what's going on in Salt Lake City. Um, we've had a number of questions in the chat box, in the Q&A box, um, that are along a similar theme. And in fact, Liz Simons kicked off uh, the, the theme of this question, which keeps coming up, which is um, Liz asked in the early on in this, in this webinar, what is the pandemic's effect on this work, especially on community math? We've had other questions related to that around how will, how will you all each modify your programs given online learning for the fall and other restrictions posed by this, this um, unprecedented time that we're in? And I think with what time left, we haven't just enough time for everybody who's 
been a part of this discussion as a panelist to weigh in on that's the elephant in the room in front of all of us. What is this particular time that we're in demanding of you and your program and your hopes for growing family math and for um, fueling co-investment around family math? Let's start with you, Omo and Geetha. Hi, sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, for us, I mean, it's put an emphasis on digital technology, but um, I think the same idea that we had going into this is the idea that we have now. And that's really how do we help, um, you know, learning, connect learning between the home, the community and the classroom. And so we've thought about engaging providers, engaging, you know, folks that are um, at the, in the school systems to really begin to think about um, you know, as things are in flux, like what are the learning experiences going to be for kids? And we know it's probably going to be a combination of virtual and, um, you know, in classroom learning experiences. And so I think we, what we've tried to do is really hone in on, and I was excited. We were on a call with um, a group out in Worcester that, um, you know, the Family Math Initiative supports, and they were really excited in thinking about again you know how do we create resources that can live in the community that parents can access at home and that um, connect to the experiences that they're going to have in the classroom as well thank you amokita do you have anything to add to that you know I, I i think it's actually really i think this is a real opportunity and i think also a real benefit that we're talking about family math and community math because, uh, you know, I just recently saw a really wonderful article written by a teacher who talked about the fact that the way we are thinking about in-school le in learning right now could actually be very detrimental to kids' social-emotional health. It, you can imagine yourself, you know, as a child, you're, you're, you're with your friends, but you cannot touch them, you cannot reach them, you cannot play with them, you're surrounded by plexiglass, you're you're admonished for touching, for feeling, for, uh, you know, so I think, the, I, I hope that we are looking much more at this new way of investing in education that is all the time learning, you know, rather than in school learning. Um, so I, I think this could be a really good opportunity for us to rethink education from a full time learning perspective as well. Uh, thank you. That's a really good point and uh, good food for thought and reflection for all of us. Before we go on to the other panelists to respond to that question, I just want to call your attention to the fact that you should have just seen a funder to funder uh, very short survey pop up on your screen. Please be sure to answer that today. It helps us make these, um, these webinars better going forward and we want to do everything we can to get your feedback to um, be in our continuous improvement uh, zone. So thank you for that. Um, and now I'd like to turn to David and Kate to see if they have further thoughts on their adaptations during this time that we're in. Yeah, Kate, I'll, I'll lead off um, just probably with the, with the obvious statement, which is kind of flexibility and adaptability is the name of the game for us and probably everybody. Um, but the nice advantage that we have in kind of that funded program model that, that Serve Minnesota brought to this partnership is that we have school staff included as part of the kind of operation ownership of the program in the program in when it's being executed. So they're there to be trained. Um, they're there providing regular support throughout the year. And what that means for us is that we have somebody that can lead in, in a way that's consistent with how the school's approaching its local context. Because it, I mean, it's, it could be different today than it's gonna be in three months. It could be different in two communities, you know, that are, that are right next to each other, much less thousands of miles away. So we really, we really feel fortunate to be able to have that kind of local um, colleague working on, working and just adapting with us. But I will say from our perspective, there's some things we can do. You know, we are, we are kind of getting everything from the training to the actual delivery of our programming into kind of the, 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 the current state of the art or kind of modern era. So we can meet schools. If the local context is such that we have to do live um, support, you know, like we're kind of having this meeting right now, uh, we'll be able to do that. Um, if it's such that it needs to be pre-recorded 
and delivered so that a family can do it, you know, when they, when they actually have the family members around to actually kind of do the support, then we'll have that ready too. And we've already been proving that and doing that even before the last year ended. Um, and then lastly, I think that, you know, if, if we're in a, if we're fortunate enough to be in the schools, we'll really be able to just kind of fit right into with whatever safety precautions they're making. Um, this is not to say for anybody it'll be easy, but I think we're, we're we've pretty well internalized flexibility and adaptability. David, I would just add that we, you know, as you mentioned, we have the curriculum, we have the community partnerships, the family partnerships, and now with this new early math coming out of pilot, it's just perfect timing to be a positive influence on what could be a, not only a summer slide, but a COVID slide on the, you know, going backwards on, you know, the children's education. So I think it's very timely. And I, I think what we do is we just power down and we just do more of what we're ready to do. So I think it's, um, it's on us, and I think uh, these partnerships are key. Thank you, Kate. Nikki, do you, that's wonderful. Do you have any thoughts, Nikki, about Reach Out and Read and Reach Out and Read Counts in this time of COVID? Yes, um, as you're probably all aware, there's a lot of um, chaos within the um, healthcare system with regards to COVID-19, and that's affecting pediatric care as well. Um, having said that, that um, many clinics have been very inventive about how to continue well child care. Telehealth is on the rise and um, we have created um, tools to help uh, deliver reach out and read using um, telehealth. And, and so they can carry on as far as possible with delivering both reach out and read and reach out and read counts that our math initiative using books and just um, encouraging families to use their books at home or things at home that they can talk about. Thank you so much, Nikki. That's wonderful. Um, I am really heartened and encouraged and humbled by all that we have been able to cover here today as a community of funders and activists trying to promote family and community math as an early learning strategy. If there's ever been a time when we need to support families and communities in helping their child's early development around numeracy, math literacy, the language of math, which we've heard so much about today, I don't know what it is if it's not right now. So I am hoping that the funders on this, on this webinar today are really encouraged to think boldly about ways that they can co-invest, about ways that they can come together to create a, a pathway for math to become seamlessly integrated in all of the interactions that we bring to our children and families. It's a rare and spectacular opportunity. We know the developmental window is never higher. And so I hope we can see this as a call to action to come together and learn from each other, trade ideas and innovations and lift each other up as we all do this essential work that the campaign is helping us um, steward forward for the sake of all our children. Um, thank you all so much. I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah Torian now for a quick recap and, and final reminders. You will be getting a whole bunch of info from us following up on this webinar soon. So, so stay with us and thank you for all you're doing. I would just like to reiterate what Ginger just shared in terms of our appreciation for um, all of the panelists that joined us today. Liz Simon, Kimberly Brenneman, Omawali Moses, Keith Pradhan, David Parker, Kate Kelly, Nick, Nikki Shearman, and Ginger Young for guiding us through this conversation as well. I don't know about you all, but I was incredibly inspired and I learned so much about these innovative new ways to think about how to embrace um, early math and support parents and um, teachers and other community members in promoting early math for young children, preparing them for future success. Um, thank you so much for, to all who joined in for the conversation today and listened in and learned with us. I hope that you found it informative and inspiring as well. And then I hope that you'll continue to join in. We've got our next uh, Funder to Funder conversation scheduled, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, for next week at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Hope you'll join in for that. We'll be engaging the two of the funders involved in the Early Educator Investment Collaborative, talking about how we can support early learning educators build their capacity to um, support children in these very critical early years. And then I hope you'll tune in possibly later on this afternoon in an hour for our next JLR Learning Tuesdays webinar, um, where we'll be exploring how to leverage spaces where children and family 
frequently are to support children's learning and development as well. And then hopefully you can continue joining in for additional GLR Learning Tuesdays conversations. We've got them scheduled throughout the month of August as well as uh, the remainder of July as well. So I hope you'll continue joining in and learning with us uh, every Tuesday for GLR Learning Tuesdays. And then until then, I hope that you will take care and be safe and be well. Thank you again. Bye-bye.